This show is built on the power of storytelling to change the world. Today's guest has built her career telling stories that matter, whether in documentaries, feature films, or on television. She's Mary Rolick this week on Story in the Public Square. Story in the Public Square. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me today virtually from his home is my great friend and colleague, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. We're joined today by a filmmaker who's known as one of the 35 under 35 by Hollywood Reporter. She works in film and documentary films and in television. You might know her for her work most recently on the Netflix series Atypical. Mary Rolick, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So we want to start off first just checking on how you're doing amidst all this, amidst uh, the pandemic. You, your family, are you well? We are. Thank you. Yeah, we're safe and we're healthy right now and just trying to stay sane and take it hour by hour. Well, and that, we're all in that, in that boat, I think. Uh, so we, there's a lot we want to talk to you about your career and the, your current projects. Uh, but let's start sort of in the beginning. And, and, and did you always know you wanted to be a filmmaker? I didn't, and um, I, it was something that I actually growing up didn't even know was possible as a job. Um, I grew up in Iowa and Massachusetts, and I didn't know any filmmakers and had no idea what Los Angeles was like or if I could even go there. And um, I was in later in my senior year of high school, I, I had a friend who was working, who was visiting from London and her father was a cinematographer. And I ended up visiting a set where I got to see for the first time what that was and that there were a lot of jobs and opportunities sort of around that space that were possible. And seeing somebody do that for the first time was kind of what piqued my interest in it um, when I was in, going into college. And so did you, did you know, like, was it automatically, was it, I want to be a producer? I want to be a director. I want to be a writer. What, what, what captivated you about it? You know, I did, I had no idea. I just knew that I loved storytelling and I loved filmmaking and I loved watching movies and I was, you know, just drawn to it from a young age. And then going into school, I just started taking film classes and film theory and film criticism and sort of not really sure where that could lead to. Um, when I was in between my junior and senior year of college, I came out to LA and had an internship and discovered a thing called development, which I had never you know, heard of. You kind of hear about directors or writers or actors, but not kind of executives behind the scenes. And once I w was aware of that, I felt like, oh, that's super interesting. I can read material and read stories and see what's interesting and how can I fix it and work with writers and work with directors. And that part of it was really exciting to me. And um, then, you know, when I was working as an assistant for an executive, I would listen in on her phone calls and on the other end of the phone were always producers calling and talking about stories and, you know, writer ideas and director ideas. And I thought, I want to be on that end of the phone. I want to do what they're doing. I want to be on set. I want to see what that's like to actually take it and then go with it and make it. Um, and so that's sort of where I became interested in producing. I want to just follow up on one piece of that. So when sure. you were just starting out and you were in development and you were reading all those scripts, I think about early in my career, one of my very first jobs was as a journal editor. And I read thousands upon thousands of journal manuscripts. Most of them were pretty terrible but it made me a better writer. Is it the same sort of ex experience? And, and I would imagine it would be, but is it the same sort of experience in terms of that exposure to so much product helps you develop as a, as a, vo a voice of your own? Yeah, I, I think so. And I think part of what I would do and something I tell people to do who are sort of beginning their careers and trying to figure out what their point of view is, is doing notes on something that isn't good or, you know, isn't perfect is 
is so important because I think it's like, how can I make this better? What is it about it that I do find interesting? And is there something that I can connect to? And what, what do I think about this? Or why don't I like it? You know, because I feel like it's not just about good writing or bad writing. Sometimes it is, but usually there's something in there that um, you can respond to. And then if you can figure out how to fix it or make it better or improve upon it, I think that's part of what I just loved. And so, yes, constantly reading material, but also thinking about, okay, maybe this story in this specific format isn't appealing to me, but what would make it something that I would want to watch? So we're going to get into your work momentarily, but for those in our audience who may not be 100% versed in Hollywood production, talk about what a producer does on a show like a typical or a film. Because I think a lot of our people don't know and, and, and our audience and would find it interesting to hear from someone who does it at top level. Sure, I think it's one of those questions that even all producers would answer differently. You know, I think uh, my parents are probably a little like, what is it that you do exactly? And I have to sort of explain it because it really depends on what, um, what for me, it really depends on what the needs are of the project. So I, as a producer, what I do is probably different than a lot of other producers and what they do is different from what I do. And I think for me, it's, I work with writers, I work on story, I, you know, give feedback and I'm really involved in hands-on specifically with a typical, the showrunner and creator, Rabia Rashid and I, we speak constantly about story, how to use the room, what should we, you know, what writers do we want to bring on staff? What directors do we want to bring on staff? How, how do we want to fit that into the schedule that we have? Um, you know, I work on making sure that the budget stays, you know, work with the line producers, make sure the budget is, uh, you know, where it needs to be. Um, I do creative input on what songs should be in the show and, you know, working closely with every person involved in that post process. Um, I go to color sessions and look at the color of the show before it airs and mixes and listen to feedback and, you know, and I deal with HR issues if we have them. Um, Right now, I feel like part of my job as a producer is being a psychologist and making sure that everybody's okay because it's such a hard time. And, you know, for the most part, you're, you're, everybody's, you're dealing with human beings and you're trying to create an environment that feels, you know, safe and good. And, um, you know, it can be high, highly stressful sometimes and just making sure that everyone's okay and that, um, you know, you at the end of the day, are making something and putting every step of the way that you go, I feel it's my job to make sure that we're put, you know, everything that we're doing is working towards the greater goal of whatever the vision is for that project. So whether that's with the writer or the creator alongside with the director and making sure that you find the right director to put that on screen, um, all of it. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pieces. Um, and that's probably only a fraction of the answer, but um, that's a general sort of, you have your hands in a lot of different places. So in project. the business world, the parallel would be a, a sort of a hands-on CEO. That's a parallel. Yeah, to... I think so. And I've also- you got your hands you know, on everything. You do. And 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 to be honest, you, you can not have your hands on certain parts if you don't want to. I think it's just that for me, what I love about it is that in my job, I have the opportunity to do that. So being in casting sessions and, you know, being in post and going to marketing meetings and yeah, it's sort of overseeing from the very, very beginning to the very, very end of a project um, is what I love, you know, what I do. Well, so talk to us a little bit about Atypical. I have to tell you that my my teenage daughter, when I told her you were going to be on, she said, is she from Atypical? And, <laughs> uh, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, she is. And so she loves that show. But tell, for the, for the audience who maybe hasn't found it on Netflix yet, tell us what the show's about. Sure. It's a family show about um, a young man who is on the spectrum. And in the first season, he's you know, 18 and he's sort of just, he really wants to find love and have sex. That's sort of his, you know, what his goal is in season one. And it's sort of the, the reality of like what that's like for him, what that's like for anybody, but specifically a young man on the spectrum and his family. And really it's the relationships of this family and their friends. And it's really just a, you know, a, it's a heartfelt 
hopeful comedy um, with, you know, with a real issue at the core of it. And I think um, what's been so special about that show and that project is um, being able to kind of connect with people who haven't seen their story represented on TV before um, in a way that Sam, the main character, is sort of, you know, representative for not all, obviously, but some people who can connect to that um, that person and what they're going through. I've been a fan since the moment I discovered it, season one, and watched mm -hmm. it uh, watch it evolve through season three, which uh, recently concluded. Um, and and I love the acting. I like the the dramatic elements of it, the comic elements of it, the way you weave in, you know, not simply, you know, the main character, uh, but also Sam's family, his mother, his father, his sister, and so forth. So that all works on on such a great TV and screen level, but something else that appealed to me was that you were examining someone living on the autism spectrum and, and mm -hmm. sort of in a greater sense taking a look at mental health in general i think that's one of the great hallmarks of the show talk about that because that's a, such a critical piece of, of 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 the spirit and essence of the show yeah that is um you know at the heart i think what um when rabia was wanting to tell this story, kind of telling a story about love and acceptance and feeling normal, but from the specific point of view of a young man who's on the spectrum. And I think, you know, one of the one of the sort of blessings and challenges of that is really um, taking very precious care of that, you know, in a way that's specific to this character versus sort of telling every single person's story. Um, you know, I think one challenge is always feeling like you're being honest and true to the characters. And this, you know, for Sam, um, it's always been about what is it that he would go through? How would he navigate this situation? Um, you know, and we certainly, you know, we have excellent consultants. We speak with people who are on the spectrum. We meet with people and we have been welcomed into the community in a really wonderful way, especially after the first season, which, you know, going in, nobody knew what it was or how it would be handled. And I think um, Rabia, the creator, did an incredible job of sort of, you know, telling an honest story from this character's perspective. And we're really, you know, it's something that um, we care a lot about and we spend a lot of time and, you know, um, make sure that it's it's done in a way that feels um, honest and, and again like specific to Sam's character. Um, the same thing goes for you know in season uh, over the course of the seasons. There's other you know things that come up, including sort of queer identity, and um, that's another place that we feel it's really important to do kind of an accurate and honest representation for what the character is going through. Again, it's not every single person who's you know going through this is going to have the same reactions but um the response has been incredible that i think people really see that there's they're seeing stories that are representative of something a piece of what they're going through and i think um i'm really proud of the work that we've done to be able to kind of show that one of the things that strikes me about it too is we've had on the show before lisa genova who writes books about people with various uh, neurological conditions and living with those. And so uh, sort of getting a glimpse inside the mind of a young adult with autism uh, is, is fascinating. You, you mentioned you've got these consultants. I wonder if you can say a little bit about uh, the research that goes into to getting that right. Yeah, I mean, we, we really, it's again, it's we have, um, two different um, sort of day-to-day -day consultants, I would say that they, you know, look at the outlines, they look at the scripts, they look at the cuts, and they sort of um, give their feedback. One one of them is a writer who's on the spectrum, David Finch, and another is a, you know, a, um, a UCLA professor, Rochelle Dean, who they both have a lot of experience, one from a personal place and the other from working with people who are on the spectrum and can give sort of um, their feedback. And it, it it's really invaluable because I feel like both of them coming from their own experiences and exposure and um, point of view can help us sort of say like, oh yeah, maybe 
um, it, it's really specific. It, you know, I almost, I wish I could think of a good example, but David, you know, he sometimes can be like, oh, this tiny little detail is something that I wouldn't, you know, would be very difficult for somebody on the spectrum to, you know, would respond in a different way. And so we can use that and say, oh, that's really helpful. That's good to know. We wouldn't have thought of it like that. Um, and just kind of, you know, again, like bringing in all the research and all of the information every step of the way that then we can, you know, use and Rabia and the writers can sort of look at and say, okay, well, maybe David wouldn't have been in that situation and done it that way, but with Sam and kind of looking at Sam as a specific, you know, individual and seeing that, um, maybe he would navigate it a little differently or the things that he's learned over the course of the seasons um, as a person uh, to kind of, you know, use that as we go. So it's again, like unique to this person's journey. You get a sense that this show has helped public understanding and acceptance of people living on the spectrum, because I would argue that it, that it has. I, I, don't have scientific evidence to back that up, but I, I know from a long career of writing about mental health and individuals that stories have a big impact on the public. Do you get that feedback from? from I do. People? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, I don't have studies either, but the personal feedback that I get and that, um, you know, what it's been like to see their family represented on TV in a way and that other people in their life now understand what they are going through um, to have somebody, you know, a child on the spectrum or the struggles of being a parent and what that's like for them. And I think um, me personally, I've had so many people reach out and tell me either I never knew anybody on the spectrum and now I now I feel like I do. And then I met someone and now I have an understanding. So they're sort of like, it's coming at it from all different places. Um, and I think it, I've, I've felt that from the beginning that, um, you know, people are really aware now in a way that I think is so important because even for myself, while I do know people who are on the spectrum and I have, you know, in my life, there's just a different, when you, like you were saying, when you, when you're, when you're, see, when you see something in a story and you connect to a character, it changes the way that you see them, right? You start to see them as a whole person, not just this, you know, somebody who's on the spectrum. And so I think it humanizes, um, it humanizes it and the people behind it. And I think that um, I have felt that both from people who are on the spectrum and, and those who aren't um, and have a relationship with somebody uh, who is. So you, you've worked in feature films, you've worked in documentaries, you, you, you work on the series on Netflix. Yeah, I'm curious, you know, but in a lot of your work, there seems to be a focus on what I would call stories that matter, right? They're, they are they, they are stories that have a broader societal impact than just merely entertainment. I'm curious if that's something that you are consciously drawn to, or if, is that just the way sort of your career has worked out? I think it's it's subconsciously drawn to, you know, I think um, for for me, I, I, whatever, whenever I respond to something, I tend to look at, like, I'll, when I take a step back and look at the work that I've done, or stories that I respond to, or books I love, or movies I love, or things I'm really proud of, I do see that theme. And I think it's because I want to tell stories that have heart. And I want to tell stories about, um, I love telling stories about people who are different finding each other and what it means to be different and what it means to fit in and you know i think um being an other and what's that like and how do you find your voice and i think those are stories that i you know care about and respond to and i think that's maybe why i've gravitated towards them and then have been able to work on them so hollywood has long been male dominated that is starting to change you and your and the atypical creator are evidence of that, but it still is it still is a long ways to go. If if you were to give a commencement address at a, at a high school or a film school, what would you say on this issue? What what would you say to the young women who are sitting there? <laughs> I would probably spend months working on that speech because I think <laughs> well, it's you got so... five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's so important, you know. And I have a daughter now, and so I think about it all the time of what I want her to feel as a girl and as a you know girl growing up and what it's like to I have that identity kind of 
obviously within you, but I'll put on you too. Um, and I think for me, for young girls and women coming out into the industry, and I think it's so important to just trust in yourself, know, know your voice and believe in it and speak up because it's taken me a long time and it still takes me time where I, where I hold back or where I don't speak. And I think um, I try to figure out why is that and where did that come from in my life? And I, and I think it's important to just be who you are. And it's really the more unique and the more specific and the, the stronger, you know, you understand and clearer you understand yourself, I think the better filmmaking there will be and the more people will relate to that because I do think that people really connect to specificity. And I think, um, you know, even if it's not the exact same story, I think women being voices on screen and behind the scenes, you you start to feel that throughout in what the different kinds of stories are. And I think that's important too with diversity and, you know, having more diverse voices um, behind the screen and, you know, in front of the camera and all of that. I think it's, uh, yeah, I think, Oh, I wish I had had a month to write that, but you know, think, <laughs> that was pretty good. I, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty good. Yeah, right. You don't need a month. <laughs> you know, so I, you know, I, I, I watch, uh, I, I work uh, my day job on a college campus and I watch mm -hmm. uh, college students uh, spending hours and hours and hours with their phones and their cameras and making little <laughs> short films on TikTok. Yeah. And, I'm curious if you have thoughts about sort of that next generation of, of filmmakers. Is, is that constant exposure to filmmaking going to change the way people like you 20 years from now do your do your work? I'm sure it will. I mean, I, I think it's the industry has changed in the 15 years that I've been out here, and I think it's going to continue to change, and we've got to catch up and keep up. You know, I was getting Netflix when it was thought to be a web streaming, you know, format, and I think, what's the next thing? And TikTok is, <laughs> man, like, I, I am trying to keep up with what it is, and I think, um, yeah, I think short-form storytelling is super interesting to me. Um, I think that there's, like, I... I, find, I think that shorts are some of the hardest material to make because you have to be able to tell a good story in such a short amount of time. And I think this next generation is used to it. They're they're clever, they're smart, they're coming up with ways of doing that. And I think um, it will affect the way that we process material and watch it and binge it and see it. And uh, I'm excited for what that looks like. I have no idea what it's gonna be like because I feel like I'm still in the old school world of it now, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. and. You know, who knows what movies are going to look like in a year from now when people are filming in, you know, like this. So it'll be uh, it'll be interesting. So just briefly, because we don't have much time left, where does where do things stand on Atypical? You were renewed for a fourth and final season and you've got writers rooms. Just just quickly. What? Uh, where do things sure. Stand? Yeah. Well, we started the writers room for season four at the very beginning of the stay home in California order. So we've been you know, as of right now, we're in the middle of writing season four and we're doing it all from our homes while, you know, everybody's juggling this and home life. Um, but it's going really well and we're very excited about the season. I think it's going to be our best yet. We'll see, knock on wood. Um, but as far as production goes, you know, that's all in the works. We don't know yet. Um, we're, we're supposed to shoot kind of at the end of the summer, but to be honest, we'll see how things unfold over the next, you know, couple months. Um, with everything that's going on in the world and in our country, and we'll follow um, the orders. But I do think that the most important thing to us is making sure everybody is safe. And if we have to wait a few more months to shoot, then we do. And it'll, because we don't want to, you know, we would rather not compromise the story and not have people touching or something because, um, <laughs> you know, because of safety. And so we just, we just want to make sure that we're doing this right, especially because it is our last season. And so we really want to take the time and hopefully, you know, get it out as soon as we can, but um, most importantly, doing it in a safe way. So, so we've got uh, just a little bit less than a minute left here, and, and so I'm okay. curious. You know, what else are you working on? What What's next after you know you got this season of Atypical? And I'm sure that's getting the lion's share of your attention. But, but do you have, do you have other projects that you're working on? I do. I have a documentary I'm producing um, that's in the world of the opioid space. Um, and that is, you know, probably we'll see again, everything got put on hold um, during this, but um, I have 
other projects I'm pitching that I'm passionate about. And, you know, the life of an independent producer is always sort of finding projects to then sell and make and hopefully, you know, get going in the long run. But um, yeah, so I'm sort of in the middle of a few different things. So we'll see. Well, we will look forward to all of it. Uh, Mary Rolick, thank you so much for being with us. The show is atypical and it's available on Netflix season four coming soon. That's all the time we have this week. Uh, thank you for being with us. If you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for Story in the Public Square. Mm-hmm.